Okay, good morning, folks. Um, this is the morning meeting of the House Appropriations Committee on Friday, April 9th. And um, as happens after we complete our budget work, and if we don't have any um, bills that urgently need a, our attention, we take this opportunity to learn. And um, sometimes we look at aspects of state government or sometimes we look at other sorts of topics. And I invited Joyce Manchester with the Joint Fiscal Office in to um, have a to do a presentation, sorry about the dog, um, on uh, basic um, income. And I'm going to stop talking so I can mute the dog and I'll turn it over to unmute myself, not the dog. Joyce, you're up. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. For the record, I'm Joyce Manchester from the Joint Fiscal Office. So on Wednesday, I was asked to prepare some notes about uh, the program that's known as Universal Basic Income. Sometimes it's called Guaranteed Minimum Income. And we'll talk about maybe a semantic difference there. Um, so the, the basic idea is that um, a universal basic income program would provide monthly payments to households or individuals with no strings attached. And it's meant to cover some basic necessities, um, but it does not require work. It does not require a, a certain income level. It's simply meant as a payment to help folks um, do better in their daily lives. So proponents see it as a way to alleviate poverty, reduce inequality, or provide a more robust safety net to workers in rapidly changing labor markets. So the idea is that you get this money and that frees up some time and some energy so that you can decide what it is that you need to do to, to have a better life. The problem is that there have not yet been enough experiments out in the real world to know exactly how people would respond to receiving this monthly payment to use however they, they please. So uh, there have been some interesting experiments in, in some recent years, and we'll be talking about those in just a minute. First, I wanna address the term guaranteed minimum income because that is a term that you often hear um, and I've, I've sort of decided that some people use it one way and some people use it another way. So quite often people use the term guaranteed minimum income when they're thinking about a program that says every person or every household should have an income of at least X. And maybe X is 40,000 or maybe it's 20,000 or maybe it's 10,000. But if you're already working and you already have that amount of income coming into your home, then you don't receive this guaranteed minimum income. So the idea is that every household should have at least some amount. And if you've already got that amount coming in, then you don't qualify. On the other hand, the universal basic income program would say every household gets a payment regardless of what other activity is going on in the household. You could be working, you could be getting a pension, you could be, who knows, having an independent source of income, but every, every household would get this income. So I'm using the term universal basic income today to talk about a program in which all households would get a certain amount of income per month. Okay, so why are we hearing now about universal basic income? Well, I've got a little bit of history here just because I thought it was so interesting. Uh, it turns out that people have been talking about universal basic income since the early 16th century in Europe. And uh, Thomas Paine, our very own American Thomas Paine, promoted it in the late 18th century here in America, specifically for young adults. He, he felt that this was a good way to help young, young adults get established in the new world. Um, it's sort of hung around for a while. And then in the 1960s, a letter was signed by about 1,200 economists calling for guaranteed income for every American. And there was quite a lot of discussion at that time about such a program. And it probably helped 
lead to a minimum income payment by the Social Security Retirement Program and also in the Social Security Disability Insurance Program. So now there is a, a minimum amount that every Social Security recipient would get if they work a, a minimum number of years at some wage level. Um, let's see, in 2016, there was a lot of discussion in Switzerland and there was a referendum which ultimately rejected a basic income program, but again, it did spur a lot of conversation around the issue. And you may remember that presidential candidate Andrew Yang proposed $1,000 per month to every American with no requirements. So that's, that's a, a huge universal basic income program that did not come to fruition, but it was certainly out there in, in the policy discussion. So now we come to the present day and we've seen that COVID-19 has hit a lot of people very hard. And so lots of countries, many, many countries have been discussing basic income and cash transfers as you know, the United States provided these cash payments, $1,400 per individual um, to many, many people. There was a, an upper income uh, limit, but lots and lots and lots of people received that payment. Um, and also we've had uh, a reduction in the uh, employment requirement. As you know, currently, if you are unemployed, you do not have to be actively searching for work in order to receive unemployment insurance benefits. So that's a big change and it makes the unemployment payment more like universal basic income because it does not require that you be uh, actively looking for work. Uh, and you should feel free to interrupt as I'm going through this. There's lots of interesting uh, stuff going on here. So then we get to some recent universal basic income pilot projects that have been taking place. And some of these have been evaluated so we can actually think about what the results have been. The most prominent one has taken place in Stockton, California. Stockton is a town that's what, east of San Francisco, south of Sacramento, uh, not, not a very well-to-do town. Um, the mayor back in 2018, 2019 was Michael Tubbs and he really spurred the, the universal basic income pilot project in his city. It was called SEED, the Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration. It was funded completely by philanthropic interests. So no uh, tax money was used to, to pay for it. Um, Let's see, recipients had to be 18 years old. The median income, median household income in the city of Stockton was about 46,000. And uh, recipients had to be living in a neighborhood where the median household income was not greater than 46,000. So these were not uh, folks living in higher income neighborhoods within the city. But if you lived in a neighborhood with median income 46,000 and happen to have higher income, you still could be a recipient of this, of this program. Okay, now what's interesting to me is that the town, the, the city of Stockton arranged to have waivers so that there was no reduction in other safety net programs. So if you were receiving um, food stamps or rental assistance or uh, pensions or other, other programs, uh, unemployment insurance, those benefits were not reduced. You simply received an extra payment. And in this case, it was $500 a month. And after discussions with community folks, they decided to issue it via a prepaid debit card so that nobody could feel that they were left out of the program because they didn't have a banking account or they didn't have a way to access the money and so forth. So they were mailed a prepaid debit card for $500. Okay, so this was a randomized control trial. And if you're familiar with experiments out there in the world of uh, social policy, you know that randomized control trials are the gold standard. So what happens is that you, you find a, a lot of similar types of households, you assign some of them to receive the benefit, 
and you include the others who don't receive the benefit, but they are the control group. So you're looking at how they behave relative to how the recipients of the monthly income would behave. So this program started in 2018, and I'm, I'm sorry, in uh, February of 2019, it actually uh, got underway. And after February of 2020, uh, a research group was, um, was able to access a lot of data and study the results. So, uh, oh yes, I forgot to mention the entire program uh, cost about $3 million. So that's, that's what it costs to get it going. Um, and we now have these results after one year of the program. So here are some of the results that have been found to date. Now, this is from the first year of the program, and there will be even more research conducted once the program is completed after the, the two-year stint. But this is what they've found so far. So first off, recipients experience less income volatility over time and relative to the control group. So here's an example of why you want to have a control group. Maybe the, the city of Stockton was on an upswing from February 19 to February of 2020. And maybe everybody was doing better. OK, so this control group allows you to compare the recipients to the folks who did not get the extra money. And yes, there was less income volatility among the recipients. Secondly, and this is the result that's probably gotten the most attention, recipients obtained full-time employment at more than twice the rate of non-recipients. So the idea is that if you have extra income, it may mean that you can take a day off from work and look for a better job or get the certification for the work that you're doing or enroll in a, uh, an evening class uh, because you can afford a babysitter for your kids. It just might offer enough flexibility so that you can do other things. Should we stop for a question? Mary, you're muted, but I'm going to assume you you just called on me. So thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> um, Joyce, thank you. So I, I'm reading the footnote regarding the, the income fluctuation. I just want to get a, a good definition so that I can understand that. The footnote states that, that recipients' income fluctuated 46.4% monthly. So let's just round it to 50%, and I'll give you an, an example of what I think it means. If your income was just pull a number out of the air, $100, it could go down to 50 or up to 150 on a monthly basis. Is that, a, is that what this, uh, you know, what the, uh, the study has found? Yes, that's right. It's actually the coefficient of variation, which means it's the standard deviation divided by the mean. But um, you don't have to get that statistical if you don't want to. <laughs> I don't. So, okay. So I think, I think you're on the right track. Okay, yes. thank you. Yes. Okay. So, so now uh, we're talking... Excuse sorry. me, Joyce. Another hand. Jim? Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mary. We can just call on ourselves if you yeah. can. That's easier. <laughs> um, Joyce, uh, it's interesting in looking at this um, uh, Stockton uh, example and some of the results from the you know, study. Um, although God, they couldn't have picked a worse time with the pandemic starting in 2020 because you know, it kind of begs the question with the world turned upside down, uh, um, you know, what is it, what does it really mean? But I'm, I'm curious, you know, oftentimes we hear, you know, we've got a, a you know, an area might have a, a, a generous safety net uh, and uh, does it attract people? And, and sometimes there's barriers to picking up and moving across the country, but um, I would think in a city, um, you might actually be able to measure that because you've got neighboring communities that wouldn't be that hard to move in. But maybe they put some, uh, you know, uh, barriers to, to doing that. I'm just curious if they measured that at all. What's there any change and maybe a year too early to, to know where it was just a pilot? So, in fact, in order to participate in the program, you had to be a resident of Stockton at the beginning of the program, and they're going to follow the same people over two years. So I don't think it's possible to move in midstream and become part of the program. I, th I think they wanted the continuity of, 
the same people in the program for two years. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, now we're good. So uh, we're talking about this employment effect. And, and I, I will mention that, that this is a big deal in part because other experiments have not found an employment effect. So there's going to be a lot more investigation of exactly why this has happened in the Stockton experiment and not in other experiments. Um, just to put a little bit more uh, specifics on this, uh, the recipients who were employed full time went from 28% of recipients to 40% after one year. And if you look at the control group, they, ex they went from 32% up to 37%. So a 12 percentage point increase for the recipients and just a five percentage point increase for the um, control group. And it is true that the second year of this experiment is really going to be influenced by the COVID-19 experience, which is in some sense very sad because it's going to put a new wrinkle into all the results. On the other hand, they're able to see how having this basic income will help people during such a big economic downturn. Um, and, and that could provide some, some really good insights. So um, about a year from now, we will tune in again and, and see what the results look like. Joyce, we have a, another question. Bob? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Just quickly, what would, can you give me an example of what a philanthropic income dollar is. Uh, well, so these are primarily nonprofits that are in the business, well, not in the business, their goal is to explore different social experiments. So for example, there's the Economic Security Project who donated a million dollars to this pilot project. And they receive uh, donations from, from regular people, from, from corporations and so forth. And their goal is to, to try to test some new ideas and see what works out in the real world. Yes, but in, and I won't, I won't go any further than this one. I kind of thought kind of that, but it, California is a lot different than Vermont as far as available monies in that respect or i certainly would think so you know so that may be i i i have not investigated uh where all the philanthropic dollars came from but i i would imagine that some of them are coming from nationwide nonprofits, not necessarily just uh located in california but um we can look into that yeah all right thank you sure Okay, so, so we've talked a little bit about the employment effect and, and how having this basic income may just allow people the freedom to explore more avenues for um, future employment and, and, and uh, getting certifications and, and so forth. But there were some other notable uh, results as well. For example, <clears throat> recipients were less anxious and depressed, both over time and compared to the control group. And of course, when you're less anxious and depressed, you probably do better on the job and you probably are more willing to think about um, what comes next af after uh, your current job. Recipients saw statistically significant improvements in emotional health, fatigue levels, and overall well being. And again, um, <clears throat> these are all measured using uh, instruments that are known to people in the, in the world of uh, measuring mental health and, and uh, emotional well-being and so forth. The Kessler 10 and the SF36, which means nothing to me, but probably means something to some of you. Um, they also, the, the researchers also asked, if you had an unexpected expense of $400 this month, how would you pay for it? And at the beginning of the experiment, the recipients, 25% of recipients said they could pay for it with cash and the others would have to borrow money. Who knows where they would borrow it from, but um, they didn't have $400 in hand to pay an unexpected expense. But after a year, that number went up to about 50%. So about 52% of people were able to pay with cash for an unexpected monthly um, expense. 
Um, yes, and the researchers did say that that, that could be particularly important given the, uh, the pandemic that hit everybody shortly after the end of the first year of this experiment. The researchers also asked how people spent this uh, basic income. And about 37% of the money was spent on food, about 22% on sales of various kinds of merchandise, such as home goods, clothing and shoes, discount dollar stores, about 11% on utilities, 10% on auto costs, and less than 1% on alcohol and or tobacco. So this has always been a, a big question. How are people gonna spend the money? Are they just um, you know, spending it on frivolous things or are they spending it on necessary things? So it's important to, to look at the data on that. So that's where we are on the Stockton pilot project. Some of you might've heard the NPR story Wednesday morning, which spurred some of the conversation that led to this uh, investigation. So um, it is getting some attention and I, I expect it will get further attention as time goes on. Okay, so we can move on to a few other examples and I know much less about these other examples, um, but it's interesting to think about uh, how different experiments were conducted. So Ontario established the Basic Income Pilot Project in April, 2017. The pilot project was set up with uh, the goal of giving fixed income to people with, with low or no income. So again, a, a, an income threshold. The, the project was supposed to run for three years. In this experiment, if there was other um, uh, earnings, so if people had a job, their basic income was reduced 50 cents on the dollar. So if you earned $100 a week, your basic income was reduced by $50 a week, okay? Um, unfortunately, after about a year, the government in Ontario changed from the liberals to the conservatives and the program was stopped. So instead of three years of data, there's about one year and a few months of data. And of course, people felt rather annoyed, upset, and frustrated that the experiment was stopped midstream. So um, there were very few employment effects detected in that experiment, but recipients did say that their health, self-esteem and job prospects were enhanced. So that's the Ontario project. Now, this is an interesting one. In Finland, 2000 unemployed folks were given about $600 a month for two years, beginning in 2017, no strings attached. This was the first nationwide basic income experience, but it was not considered a big success, in part because employment effects, again, were minimal. Only a very small difference between the steady group and the control group in terms of finding work. Um, Again, the recipients did report statistically lower levels of insecurity and stress. Uh, part of the difference may be that in Finland, of course, many basic needs are taken care of by the government. So you have health insurance, you have childcare, you have lots of things that um, are, are quite different from the way the world works in the United States. Uh, Joyce, we have a question, Robin. Yeah, thanks. And thanks, Joyce. That actually was going to be my question or comment, because as a, as a Scandinavian country, I know they offer much more in the way of support. So I wonder if there's any way to um, control for that or, you know, look at the data in a different way, because maybe it's a success in that it's less needed because there are other supports. You know, if there's a, if there's a way to look at that differently, because it really isn't comparing. We have much much more unequal distribution of wealth in our country, and they do not. Absolutely, and I think as, as there are more experiments in different countries, we'll be able to control for those other social factors that will give us a better understanding of what, what programs would do in different settings. Right, so uh, this doesn't surprise me that it would be less of a success and that it would be more in a place like Stockton where the inequality is so much greater. Great, right. thanks. 
Finally, I'm going to wrap up. I see I've just about ran out of time. There's an experiment going under going on right now in Kenya with a very high level group of researchers uh, running the show in terms of collecting data and evaluating it. So um, about 15,000 households in almost 300 villages in Kenya were randomly assigned to either no payment or um, a payment monthly for 12 years. So remember this just started in 2018 and will go on for 12 years. Another group will receive payments to cover basic needs for two years. And then a, a fourth group will get payments to um, as a lump sum. So just a one $500 payment. And, and the experiment, it seems to be really well designed so that they can look at the various outcomes from, from all of these different groups. They've got a Nobel Prize winner, Abhijit Banerjee, who is well known from MIT, who's going to be helping with that, with that um, evaluation. So let me stop there. I see we're almost out of time. Yeah, thank you, Joyce. That, that was, to me, very interesting. And I had not realized that so much was happening, nor that his, the history of this, which I particularly enjoyed. Um, Dave? Um, are we wrapping up at 9.30 sharp? I'll try yeah, to- Well, not at sharp. I, I think- Oh, okay. Two I'll, minutes. I'm sorry. Yeah. And that wasn't my question, but I'll try to be uh, succinct. Um, Joyce, could you imagine some type of hybrid um, in Vermont, um, we provide a lot of cash assistance to people, none of it a full therapeutic dose. If you're eligible, we say, here's money for food, maybe cover 30% of your food allowance. If you're eligible, we say, here's money for childcare, doesn't cover the full cost of childcare. If you're eligible, we say, here's money for housing, doesn't often, section eight, you could argue might cover the full cost of housing. So we provide significant amounts of money. If you're eligible for reach up, here's a monthly cash assistance, doesn't cover uh, enough to make ends meet. But if you add it all together, it's not insignificant. But today it's very categorical. None of it enough to meet the needs for which it's, it's given. Could you imagine going to the federal government requesting a waiver to pool those dollars and then not for everybody, it wouldn't be folks perhaps like us, um, but for certain income categories and with uh, financial coaching, et cetera, you might then go to a person and say, uh, with certain parameters, how would you like to use this money? And you might say, you know, I'm going to nail the housing because I want to be stable. I want to have a place where I put my head on the pillow and not worry about it. I'm going to get some reliable transportation. Then I can get a job and I'll take care of my food budget. But it's more independent. You might feel better about things and it might be more productive. Has there been any pilots or waivers along that line that you're aware of? Thank so, you. Right, so that's a great question. And that's exactly why people are studying the um, experiments in Kenya so carefully, because of course there is that lump sum that says, here's a lot of money. You can decide how to use it. Some people might decide this is the time to, to invest in education and I'll skimp on housing and I'll skimp on food and, and whatever. Um, other people might decide this is the time to start a business and I'll, I'm gonna plow the money into a business and so forth. So um, yeah, that's the best experiment that I know about that would say, just give people a, a basic income and let them decide how to allocate it among the various needs that, that they have. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Um, Dave asked the, the, a, a more detailed question than I had had in my mind. And I was just up at the kind of, boy, we've tried lots of different ways to alleviate poverty and have spent so much money over the years. Yet, in fact, there seems to be more poverty now than at, at least times in the past. We certainly haven't made the progress that I think folks had hoped or thought we would coming out of the 30s and 40s. Um, in, in, I'm not proposing 
that we do something like this, but I think this is an interesting question about can we be rethinking about how how we um, support folks who who are trying to climb their way out of difficult circumstances and that was that was some of my thinking behind just asking for a, a presentation on it not not because there is a proposal coming but just what we're doing doesn't seem to be working as well as we had would hope and is there a different way to think about this um i I, I've not seen any more hands and I know that we're past 930. Um, and I just, let me say, thank you very much, Joyce. Um, and I know that you're planning on turning this into an issue brief when you have a chance and maybe it's something we can continue um, to use the term of art noodling on over time. Um, Peter. Thanks Mary. No, this is interesting. I, I, I you know, I, enjoyed seeing how people felt about uh, about um, these uh, these funds and receiving these funds on a whole different topic um, hopefully did you see my response email regarding the the uh, the pension sheet going forward in other words what our uh, adec would be going forward we need to get that updated um, okay. so that we can understand the the um, the results of the uh, the input results of the experience study and how it's going to impact future payments. Um, so we do need to get that that uh, that updated. Uh, perhaps Meta can contact the uh, the treasurer and ask for that updated sheet, or we can ask Joyce Manchester to to, uh, to, to ask Chris Roop to uh, to to, well, to get that together, or both. Yeah. So um, thank you, Peter. Yes, I did see your email, and and we will get that information. Um, so let's say thank you to Joyce and let her get on with her day. Appreciate it again. Thank you for responding so quickly to our request. Sure, I wanna say thank you. And if folks have other questions, just send them along because I, I do plan to um, finish up an issue brief in the next week or so. So if you have more questions, let me know. Okay, good. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Um, so folks, we um, the floor is now, um, we have, you know, been scheduling things for next week. We are not meeting on Monday. We will meet on Tuesday. I forget what time. Um, so far, it's the afternoon starting at okay. 1.15. So pay attention to, because we're on the floor in the morning. So pay attention to email just to see how the agenda gets updated. Um, and unless I see any other questions or thoughts, Robin? So we're done for the day in this committee. Yeah, don't get too wow. excited, yeah. <laughs> well, you picked a lovely couple of days for this. We appreciate it, Madam Chair. We've got, yeah. We need the spring weather and to get restored. <laughs> I, yeah, I think restoration is in, yeah. in order for yes. all for this committee. You guys yeah. worked really hard. Uh, so my thanks, have a terrific, beautiful weekend, and we'll see everybody on Tuesday.